Appamada's programmes and facilities are supported through your generosity. Your support really does make a huge difference. You'll find a link for contributions on the website at appamada.org forward slash contribute. Thank you so much. Welcome back. I consider it a good sign that you came back. <laughs> <laughs> and all of you in our cloud zendo, welcome. So, um, previously, we talked about creativity and practice on the individual level. How to turn our awareness and our creative impulses toward our practice itself. What was arising, whatever was arising. And our uh, journaling is a, a, a little attempt to help um, scaffold that a little bit. Um, so, and we also have had an opportunity coming together like this to recall the bonds that we have with our spiritual friends. And um, we have some rejoicing about being together and practicing together again in the same space all together. So I was thinking about this, ex the expansion of this concept of creativity and practice. What does it mean for to um, engage in creativity and practice for a sangha, at sangha level? Um, so how do we do this cooperatively? How do we achieve this same quality of mind, of freshness, of openness, of looking at possibility? Um, so this was my big question when I was thinking about this, talking with you about this, um, because our practice in, at the individual level, um, we sit zazen and we um, uh, are shaped by the forms and the roles, but we're also householders. So we have work and family and friends and hobbies and civic activities and responsibilities, right? So all of this practice is woven together. Um, and as a sangha, we are creatively co-authoring the narrative story of Apamata, as I've said many times. Um, and we are looking at what are the possibilities for this ongoing growth and development of our sangha, which is still grounded in the teachings of the Buddha and our teachers, the precepts, the Brahma-viharas, which you will recall the Brahma Viharas are loving kindness, right? Um, compassion, uh, empathetic joy, and equanimity. Those are the divine abodes. So they are part of the grounding of our community. And then the paramitas, the principles of generosity and morality, and patience, and vigor, and concentration, and wisdom. So these are the things that keep us from just being sort of adrift, like some new age invented thing. And so this is not accidental, and this is not random. This is the way Flint and I conceived it from the beginning. Also, this relational Zen quality of compassion and mutual care, both for each other and for ourselves. <coughs> So this particular Sangha has a certain shape. It has certain contours. It has certain edges and it has certain fill, right? Um, and the elements that we are incorporating into our creative expression of the Dharma are the teachings, the forms, the practices we engage in together. This is all of the things that we're doing collaboratively. The activities, ceremonies, celebrations, <coughs> fun times, the principles, the underlying Buddhist principles, and the people. So we're weaving this together into a kind of a braid, um, which is a form of a new form of Zen. So this is the form of Zen we have evolved for our time. We've created this together. So 
In our sangha level practice, just as in our individual level practice, challenges are a form of training. As just exactly as in our we view in our individual practice, I talked about yesterday. So they spur connection, they spur debate, they spur creative action and cooperation. So these challenges are part of the growth of our sangha, and they foster strength and resilience and uh, kind of confidence in our shared participation um, and a kind of openness. We're willing to try new things because the things we've been trying are working, right? Um, so this is uh, um, my sense of how we practice as a Sangha, which is qualitatively different from practicing as an individual. So it depends on the creative core of the Sangha. Um, and the creative core of the Sangha are the people who are experienced in our way of doing things, um, who study, who have relationships, and uh, who support relationships um, together, and who, um, who engage in deliberation, which is both creative and pragmatic, right? So we have to solve the everyday issues of how we keep this Sangha running, but we're also thinking about, well, how do we do this? You know, how, are we, how can we have um, an understanding of this entirely new set of challenges? So also there's a fair amount of troubleshooting that happens as a result of this creative core working together. Um, and there's a kind of grounding, as I said, in the teachings, but also in our Apolomata way of doing things. This is why bringing in some, some outside <coughs> uh, leader would be uh, counter-advised, I would say, because they don't understand our Apolomata way. Um, so also this creative course is learning all the sort of administrative uh, functions that are necessary to run a Sangha. This is almost never taught anywhere where there are priests or monks or even Dharma transmitted teachers. It's never taught. But here, our creative core, our councils, our board are gaining that kind of experience. So they also take on these responsibilities for the um, carrying, conveying forward of the teachings and the Dharma in the ways that we do it here at Abhamada. So <clears throat> I have these, these questions. How does this happen. <laughs> and I think that's uh, the question that a lot of people have in their minds. I'll be talking about this next Sunday. Um, it's because I believe, and I think this is a very egoic way to think, but there you are. I think it's because of the social architecture Flint and I built together and fostered together that we are now inhabiting in our joy together. Right? So it requires a solid foundation, and it requires building the structure that will scaffold the kinds of activities that you want to have happen. But then it's up to the inhabitants to bring the joy, to live together in harmony, to settle their differences, to solve their problems, to run things, right? So, uh, so I want to remind <coughs> some of you already know this. I'm going to um, read you an excerpt uh, from Christopher Alexander from The Timeless Way of Building very, very famous architect and was the dean of the architecture school at um, UC Berkeley and has written monumental works. But The Timeless Way of Building was one of the first things I read, even when I was writing my dissertation. I went straight into the bookshop, went straight over to the architecture department for no good reason, because I wasn't an architect or reading about architecture, and pulled this book off the shelf. And it completely galvanized my entire dissertation and my thinking about how we work together. So here's what he wrote. Um, he's talking about architecture and elements of architecture, doors, windows, things like that. And he says, it is certainly not enough merely to say that every pattern of events resides in space. This, this space, every pattern of events is happening. In that is obvious and not very interesting. <laughs> what we want to know is just how the structure of the space supports the pattern of events that it does in such a way that if we change the structure of the space, we shall be able to predict what kinds of changes in the patterns of events this change will generate. In short, we want a theory which presents the interaction of the space and the events in a clear and unambiguous way. He was very rigorous, trained as a mathematician, 
um, brilliant polygraph. <coughs> Further, it's very puzzling to realize that the elements, which seem like elementary building blocks, keep varying and are different every time that they occur. For among the endless repetition of elements, we see almost endless variation. Each church has a slightly different nave. The aisles are different, the west door is different, and in the nave, the various bays are usually different. The individual columns are different. Each vault has slightly different ribs. Each window has slight different tracery and different glass. If the elements are different every time that they occur, Evidently, then, it cannot be the elements themselves which are repeating in a building or a town. These so-called elements cannot be the ultimate atomic constituents of space. Since every church is different, the so-called element we call church is not constant at all. Giving it a name only deepens the puzzle. If every church is different, what is it that remains the same from church to church that we call church? Let us therefore look more carefully at the structure of the space from which a building or a town is made to find out what it is that is really repeating there. We may notice first that over and over above the elements, there are relationships between the elements which keep repeating too, just as the elements repeat. Beyond its elements, each building is defined by certain patterns of relationships among the elements. When we look closer, we realize that these relationships are not extra, but necessary to the elements, indeed a part of them. When we look closer still, we realize that even this view is not very accurate. For it is not merely true that the relationships are attached to the elements. It is not people having relationships with other people. <coughs> the fact is that the elements themselves are patterns of relationships. For once we recognize that much of what we think of as an element is in, in fact lies in the pattern of relationships between this thing and the things in the world around it, we then come to the second even greater realization that the so-called element is itself nothing but a myth. And that indeed, the element itself is not just embedded in a pattern of relationships, but is itself entirely a pattern of relationships and nothing else. And finally, the things which seem like elements dissolve and leave a fabric of relationships behind, which is the stuff that actually repeats itself and gives the structure to a building or a town. So this, is, this was our understanding. It's going to be um, a sangha of relationships, not a sangha of things, or even a sangha of people, <coughs> right? It's a web of relationships between us between ourselves and our space, between ourselves and the world, the pandemic, all the things that are happening that impact what we do, right? So I was really taken with this because I love this idea that all the things that we think of as things actually dissolve and it's just patterns of relationships. When I was teaching um, at UT, I had a class on um, the rhetorical construction of databases. So I wanted to explain to students that even things like databases have a rhetorical foundation. They have a purpose and they have an audience. And they're often misused because they are used for different purposes for different audiences than they were built for. So I had the students create databases and I said, a database is you know, something that has fields, that is categories of things that could repeat from one thing to another. So if you were doing a database of qualities of a person, for example, you might have height, you might have weight as a field, right? Which of those things might be a field, because those are the things which vary from person to person, but which are, you know, for which we can say there's qual those qualities are, are across all people. So I love this idea of, you know, developing this rhetorical sense of, and the students were very dutiful and they learned how to build databases and they learned how to populate them. And I had to populate them with about uh, 20 people. I had one kid, one kid, in all of the fields entirely in his database were about relationships. And I said to him, well, so what, um, you know, this is supposed to be about your identity. And then finally said, I am my relationships. I'm nothing but my relationships. And he had 200, you know, relationships listed in his database. And it was so, it was so startling to me, but I thought it's so poignant because it's true, 
really, our sense of ourselves, our own identity comes through our relationships. So, um, so I, I, I was really taken with this kid having this sense, oh, I'm just my relationships. That's what's constituting what I think of as myself. So in our practice as a Sangha, we want to make sure that we don't miss the care and the connection and the creativity and the joy that are available when we connect in this way. Um, and I think that can happen from dullness, from inattention, from absence. So, you know, I'm constantly having people say to me, oh, I'm really, I'm, I'm kind of depressed. I'm not feeling too, you know, I haven't been practicing and I haven't been going over to the Sunday and I'm like, <laughs> you're saying you're starving and you won't go where there's food, right? Um, so some kind of failure to connect, uh, failure to nourish yourself and each other, that's what could lead to the demise of a community. Right? When people get, um, I think, kind of hapless about it and don't understand the ways in which it's mutually nourishing, you know, um, to be connected. So uh, Appamata um, has, of course, its struggles and challenges. Um, it's a bumpy path sometimes. Um, but it's, uh, it's an independent path, and we're finding our way, of course, um, helping each other. It's got its challenges, um, but I consider, from my point of view, that Akamata is a blazing triumph. Um, it's actually working. It actually is realizing a vision, um, and not my vision or Flint's vision, but our shared vision. Um, about relationships, about mutual care, about our learning how to be together in liberation in ways that are not necessarily part of our history, right, or our conditioning. So we have to build this, we have to create it. This is the creative act. And so uh, I, I, I was thinking, we've given you, Flint and I, absolutely our all. We've held nothing back. Um, and we now have this precious treasure of our sangha. And even though um, people have their differences, there's a space for those differences to be held and appreciated and mobilized as information. So sometimes I was, saying, I was thinking to myself, sometimes I think the most um, use, my most useful function is to describe to you what you are already doing. You know, but most of the time I'm just saying, look, here's what you're doing. <laughs> And I don't know whether that's helpful or not. You know, you have to tell me, yeah, we don't need that. Um, <laughs> I don't figure out what we're doing. <laughs> but I think people have a lot of opinions about what we're doing that are sometimes way bleaker than the things that I see when I actually look at what's actually happened. You know, we have a solid uh, financial foundation. People's generosity has helped support us all these years. And we have a uh, fantastic board of people who are devoted and dedicated to the Sangha's well-being. And we've got all these councils that have distributed responsibilities for support and care. Our teachers, our you know, former head students and Zen mentors, there's so much depth there that isn't there in other places. And I can assure you, because I have been to the other places and I've consulted with the other places. And even though there may be a lot of people, there may, may be a lot of functionaries, there isn't this kind of depth. So, um, so I feel like I have to keep like reminding you of, you know, yeah. Just, I, I want to add one thing to the, this wonderful list that you are constructing. And that is the incredible energy from the, on, from the cloud. Absolutely. Syndrome. Yeah. And that was, that was one of the fortuitous discoveries of the pandemic. You know, one of the great gifts of the pandemic was to bring us into a larger Zendo, right? Um, that we could share together so that people could be participating even at a great distance. You know, this has been a blessing for all of us. And um, so, you know, um, I feel like uh, I have to remind myself sometimes what, um, what a journey it's been, you know, what a gift it's been to travel this way together and to have this, uh, the health and well-being of this Sangha. And so many communities are torn apart, you know, they're just torn apart. 
some of them have completely disappeared, some of the sanghas, because they couldn't get together and they didn't have any technological capacities. Um, some of them are, have really struggled with scandals and with uh, you know, bad behavior and uh, problematic song members. And, uh, and we've been really, really fortunate in that regard, really fortunate. So I feel like um, it's such a blessing. I'm so happy to be here with you because you know, it's an opportunity to share with you my impression of what, you know, as challenging as it's been, as hard as it's been for everybody, all these changes to deal with. We've come through so much together. And I feel really, really positive about this capacity for creative expression of sangha, you know, which is unlike anything I've seen. And I've, as I've said, I've been to a lot of conferences with teachers and, you know, it's, it's not like this. So anyway, that's my, that's my sense of it. And I want to leave time too for talking um, a little bit about your concerns, whatever um, questions and concerns you have. But I, um, I think it's easy to get uh, kind of um, uh, absorbed by your individual practice and forget how much we're doing this together and how much it means to be doing it together, especially when we hit, you know, really rough patches in our own personal lives. And, and when we face challenges as a sangha, that we can, that we can come together and not have it divide us or create a fragmentation. And yeah, we've not had factions. We've not, you know, it seems like, it seems like it's working. I mean, we've been doing it since 2005. This part of it, um, 2000, 2009 is when we officially changed our name, but before then, 2005, when we moved into this space. And it seems like it's working. <laughs> so that's my sense anyway. Even though for most people, it's a very unfamiliar kind of social organization. It's neither hierarchical, nor is it strictly democratic. So that's unusual for most people. It's not like a school, it's not like an office. It's different from anything most people have experienced. Not exactly like a family. Yeah, so anyway, I'm very interested to hear your um, thoughts or reflections about this. I have a question, and it may not be answerable because it's general instead of specific, but in terms of we have a sangha and we have ways that we do things and yet we're talking about creativity so is there a general way of looking at things so one would know this we're going to keep doing this this way as opposed to oh well let's try this i mean or is that just a matter of we keep experimenting or well we have resources Right. Mm -hmm. So we we obviously want to draw on the wisdom and the compassion that we develop together. Right. So we have each other as resources. Some things are um, more focused and not really the province of the whole sangha. So not necessary for the whole sangha to be involved. Um, mm -hmm. Some things are things where you want more wider perspectives on it. Mm -hmm. um, you also have uh, the teachings. That we draw on. And so are we in alignment with our values in whatever it is that we're trying to determine or decide? Mm -hmm. um, that's that's a really core important thing, right? And also you have other resources. So for example, in the um, you have Flint and I, of course, but we also have the Lays and Teachers Association, which is all teachers of songs just like ours independent sanghas that are not led by priests, but that are led by teachers that have been authorized, right? And we there are among our best friends because we, their conferences, we've learned so much, we've shared so much, and, and so many of the things that we've experienced, they've also experienced. And we can talk about how did you resolve this? How did you handle this? So it's not like there's no resources for that kind of, but it depends a lot on what's the decision that needs to be made or what, what, what's the change that's anticipated or whatever. You know, yeah, but we have 
much more solid grounding in that than most places where it's just by fiat, you know, and the teacher says, well, we're going to do this now, you know, or in other places where they muddle around in some sort of democratic model, you know. Huh. I guess I have three, three things. One is in relation to Lori's question, it seems when new situations arise, as they do every moment, then the only possibility is creative. That's right. Solutions. The second thing is, um, so all my life, I, we had art critiques. And sometimes we had visiting critics who were the best people in the world. And I noticed that two things happen. One is, as you're describing, you know, they would describe what the person's doing from there. And the <laughs> other thing is, they would tell the person what they should be doing. And that was so bad. bad. <laughs> the, the most brilliant people in the world telling yeah. someone. Yeah. And it was basically telling them to fit into something that was hip. Yeah. You know? yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, that was on trend. And, and it, so anyway, and the third, the third thing is, um, as I think about emptiness, I, what doesn't seem empty is our experience of things. And I'm wondering how that connects with what you're calling relationships. Like the relationship is real, but not the thing. Well, first of all, you know, we can't really call them relationships. So, um, because they aren't a thing. So, um, they're really dynamic relating. So, what we're always engaged in um, checking is the quality of relating. So, we're back to the ING. Yeah, back to the ING. It's like, how is the relating? Um, so, are we moving closer or are we moving apart that's neither one of those is so experiencing away. and relating would be yeah connected. yeah right. okay. and the that's emptiness it. is that there isn't a fixed thing there you know there's isn't a, a thing you know it's not, not, not like a house plant that's failing or thriving you know it's a, a relationship that's just relating it's that dynamic that seems real yeah that seems real to me too yeah and moment by moment and that's why you know that there's a moment when you could say something that would destroy the quality of relating and you would have a different way forward, right? Um, so, and that's why anger is so um, potent because it has that capacity. I guess a fourth question is, I'm, I'm really surprised when we do the walk and talk, how powerful that is compared with the conversation and it's really curious to me yeah how how more uh relating seems to go on yeah because it's not like playing badminton you know <laughs> it's really like okay um i'm deeply receiving you and i'm feeling deeply received you know and that's that's a different quality of relating, right so yeah, it's, it's something I often recommend to couples because they're busy with their everyday activities and this is all functional, you know, like, would you want to be the dishwasher? Uh, you know, the kids need to go to school or whatever, you know. Um, there's this ongoing litany of communication that isn't really deep listening. And so to have a timeout, a space where that deep listening and sharing can happen is it's very important, I think. So, um, I want to preface this by saying I feel like I'm playing devil's advocate, um, and I am really uncomfortable. Um, so, the two things I want to say is, um, one, I listen to NPR a lot, so this is kind of goes along with their uh, fact-checking mm -hmm. um, series when they're talking about politics, and that is, I want to be really clear when we talk about when I'm in conversation with other people about our sangha and other sanghas, uh, do we know for a fact that other sanghas like ACC, San Francisco Zen Center, Upaya, are they actually not doing as well as we are? Oh, I wouldn't say that. Well, that, that's my concern. I, I don't want to put us on a pedestal and say no, we are the We just have a different place. organization. We have a different social organization. Right, I get that, but I don't want to say we are you know, thriving because we do this. Um, whereas other songs are also thriving during this time, right. is my understanding. And I don't want to mix that up. With they're thriving because they're doing what they're doing. Right. Yeah. I, 
I don't want us to have people think that we are thriving only because we are doing this. The other thing is, and I, it's no surprise to um, people, I think that there, there are people who want to have Dharma transmitted teachers come speak, not just Dharma entrusted students speak. Is there a possibility that we would have Dharma transmitted teachers from other um, Sanghas come speak occasionally to us as we have in the past? Um, is that a possibility for our future here? Oh, yeah. Okay. It isn't a possibility for them to lead. No, no. I'm but, talking about just but speakers, to speak. guest speakers are always, you know, that's always. Okay. That was a possibility, and we've done that in the past. You right. Know, we right. had Peter Hershock come, we've had, you know. Galen. Galen came, right. yeah. Kosho came. Yeah. Right. That was a possibility. Okay. I just, I was curious about that. Yeah. Yeah, you put in a request. Okay. Um, Mars still came and led a workshop. Yeah, yeah. So we've, we've done a, quite a number of Right, right. and things. I know that. Yeah. We just, we haven't since the pandemic. Right. So that's that. That might be something to request, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's since that's a programmatic request that would go to the teachers. Yeah, and then they would discuss it with the councils. This is the process. I'm going to talk about this next Sunday. Jason, oh, go ahead. You're good. I've got two. Um, I did walk and talk with Kim yesterday, and when I heard Kim speak this morning, I, I heard his voice so much differently. I love Kim. I know him so much better now. It's great. <laughs> but, but just listening to him this morning after a walk and talk, I, it, it was so powerful. And I, I've experienced that before, but it's great. So here's my question. Would you ever do a walk and talk with somebody, um, maybe, maybe an ex, an ex partner? Is that, could that be, Absolutely. Dangerous or not? Dangerous? Well, how would it be dangerous? Are they going to stab you? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you're worried about that, I would. No, like just it. like maybe, maybe, maybe somebody, that, maybe, maybe you're on guard because you don't want to be manipulated. Does that make oh, sense? Oh, but it's very hard to manipulate someone in a walk and talk because they're going to talk for 10 minutes, you're going to talk for 10 minutes. You know, they're going to say whatever they say. Okay. You're going to hear it. It's coming from them. It's coming out of their conditioning, their background, their experience. You know, you're going to say what comes out of your conditioning, your background, okay. your experience. You know, like I think, um, I think in some ways it's valuable because it's very hard to listen to people you're in some sort of troubled relationship with, and so from that standpoint, it's actually beneficial. Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. Right. Yeah. It's kind of forced listening without you mobilizing your defenses, right? And thinking about how you're going to get your points in. No, like that's that's not what's going to happen. One more question, and I'll try and make this brief. My daughter's nine. I adore her. She's wonderful. And how I grew up, I talk to everyone. I don't care what your point of view is, your political <laughs> opinion, your background, your race, your religion. That's how I've lived my life. <laughs> and um, and, and I'll always be like that. It, this kind of gets to mind states over the pandemic. I almost went on a ski trip overseas when COVID started and I canceled, but I had a Twitter addiction or I developed the Twitter addiction <laughs> watching COVID. Yeah, of course, because the news was changing every second. And I don't post anything. I just read and it, the, the, it was so powerful. Um, and I, COVID was so isolating that um, I, I guess I don't have to state the obvious, like it, just the polarization or tribalism. Mm -hmm. it, I still feel the same way. I'd love it if this was, if I, I would sit in a room full of people with, with anyone, right? because I believe in the power of forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I believe in, um, in, in I, that's deep to me. Like I forgave my dad. You had to practice time. that with your dad. I was going to yeah. say, yeah. So when, I, here's my statement really. 
watching Twitter, I, I talked to Joan about this a little bit. I felt isolated, like, wait, what if I don't believe in every political position that is held here? What if, what if maybe I have a couple different ones? And I felt like, do I still fit in here? And this gets into the mind state with technology conversation as we've all been isolated. I don't think, I bet this is not uncommon, right? No, it's not uncommon. No, absolutely not. Yeah. I mean, what you're getting into is something I sometimes have conversations with my son about, which is, which I call the ethics of algorithms. So the way you're presented with information is based on an algorithm, but there's no ethical foundation to that. And in fact, sometimes there's, they subvert any ethical foundation by encouraging aggressiveness, outrage, that kind of thing, you know, so, mm -hmm. so that's what, um, that's why it's so discouraging as a medium to see how, um, how it operates. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. The Thank ethics you. of technology always have, has been since I started in the field in 1994, a vexed issue. Because you, on one side you have technologists who say it's neutral. It's just a machine. It's just a, you know, and on the other hand, you have the humanist going, wait a minute, you mm -hmm. know, like, wait, just that is not strictly true. There is a certain, there are certain ethical issues around anonymity online and, you know, like right all the way through. Yeah. 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 So. Nick? Yeah. I was thinking about, um, uh, in Care for the Songer, there's a vast difference between talking about or giving your opinion about the quality of relating and engaging in the relating. Um, a, um, it's like talking about zazen versus sitting zazen. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I think I, that's one of the things I notice. Um, I notice in myself, I notice on sometimes on the board or in councils and other mm -hmm. spaces that we can fall into the ditch of talking about the quality of relating rather than sort of fostering the kind of relating we want. That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's easy to do that. It's much easier to talk about it than to actually engage it. Yeah, because we have vulnerabilities, right? And we have uh, fear and anxiety about how that quality of relating is going to unfold if we're really genuinely open with each other or really intimate in those spaces. That's really why those spaces were created, though, so that we could practice that, not so that we could be that, because that's asking a lot, you know. But so that there's a safe place to practice um, and discover, oh, this is actually possible, right? So yeah, councils are a medium for that. The board is a medium for that. Um, if there's a willingness there, you know, you just have to um, uh, be sensitive to the fact that for some people that's going to feel really scary. And um, and so the people who have who are, who are brave can model, you know, like. This is how it goes. That's why Flint always did group psychology, group psychotherapy, you know, because the relationships between people revealed so much about their um, their boundaries, their fears, their you know, and um, and you could actually work on the quality of relating in that way. I just want to offer it is very helpful for you to reflect back to us how we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> Because often it just feels like we're, we're you know, we're building the train tracks in front of us. And... <laughs> no one talking about the flood, just, you know. You know. Yeah. <laughs> that was Flint and I for this whole time, right? Yeah. yeah. And I guess I have a curiosity how we might do that as a Sangha and, you know, how that's kind of like, how are we doing? You know, kind of what what Nate was just saying, like yeah. the quality of our relating, and yeah. I mean, I can I can certainly feel it, like personally and bodily sometimes, like I feel uncomfortable here, or yeah, what's that about? You know, is this something about yeah. the relationship? But Those practice edges. Is there? I guess this is my my question. Is there a way that we might be able to do that? Um, well, I think all sangha meetings are a good way to invite more, you know, connection, participation, um, and openness. Um, and to allay some confusion people have about the way things work. I mean, I'm going to talk about that next Sunday, but even so, we have to keep repeating it because, you know, people forget or, or people are new and they don't understand how different what we're doing is. Um, so, um, yeah, so I think 
um, and in the various venues where you're interacting with Sangha members. You know, um, I always said that the councils were like my sense organs out into the Sangha because they touch more people and connect with more people and can uh, feel where there's some difficulty or some trouble or something like that. Mm -hmm. I really count on that um, because I can't be everywhere and see everybody. But for people, someone to say to me, so-and-so is really struggling or um, these two people are having some kind of you know, dispute or whatever, um, not that I'm going to fly in and fix it, but that I, the health and well-being of the song as a whole is my primary concern. I'm not primarily concerned with individual interactions. That's not my primary concern. It's the song as a whole. So if there's some people are having a disagreement with each other, that's actually probably good for the Sangha. Sangha needs to know it can hold that. Sangha needs to know it can work through disagreements. It's got strength and resilience and all that. You know, like that's what I'm thinking. I'm not thinking, wow, she's really mad at her. What can I do to fix this? You know, that's not how I'm thinking. You know, I'm just thinking, how does this strengthen the Sangha? How does this weaken the Sangha? How does it put problems for the Sangha? How is the Sangha responding to this? You know, like that's how I'm thinking about it. But that's, you know, that's the complementary way that Flint and I work together. So he's very much interpersonal and very much about the system as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so that's my primary concern. So of course we understand each other's, you know, um, specialty, but um, our primary way of thinking about things, you know, for me is, is uh, it has to do with the health and well-being of the ecosystem that we're in, which is what's the material environment, it includes the social structures. It includes the interpersonal relating. Um, it includes our forms. It inc you know, includes these deep teachings that all this is founded on from the Buddha. So all those things are pieces of it. So sometimes what we need to mobilize is some teaching from the Buddha. Sometimes what we need to mobilize is some contemporary teacher's perspective. Sometimes what we need to mobilize is what we understand about psychological development and attachment theory or whatever. Yeah, Joel. Cool. Um, I also will be a, a, a kind of a devil's advocate, but, but uh, you know, I've never actually heard you articulate uh, what, uh, why it is important for the Sangha to be lay-led and not to have uh, a, a ordained uh, Dharma transmitted priest. You'll be like, here Sunday? Like we have had. <laughs> You'll be here and Sunday? You? <laughs> you won't be here Sunday. You're I won't. Yeah, I won't. yeah. Well, it'll be recorded. That's, what I'll be <laughs> That's exactly what I'll be talking about. <laughs> tomorrow? Okay. No, no. Oh, no. Next week. Next week. Yeah. yeah next week. Tomorrow. Yeah. Okay. Well, um, yeah. But basically, um, it's not that it needs to be lay led, it's the priests can't help you. So I know enough about priest training and about what priests do, but yeah. also, the existence of a priest class creates a division in the Sangha Flint and I watch and do not want. Mm -hmm. Because the people who are not able to be on a priest path or be ordained feel less than and are viewed as less than, no matter how much lip service is paid to all equal here. Mm -hmm. um, it's like, you're not quite the serious Zen student if you're not considering you know, the priest path, if you're not able to follow the priest path. Mm -hmm. And we did not like what the dynamics were of that. And then the priest developed a kind of sense of uh, being an aristocracy, let's say, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and then there are priest meetings that no one else gets to go to, and that fosters the idea that there's some secret elite, right? That's functioning in the background. That we absolutely would not support. There are sanghas that do that, Go there if that's what you want. <laughs> so, how does that fit with the hierarchy of identified lay teachers and select groups of people to be on that path? Because there's a hierarchy in that as well. Well, so yes. I'm just curious how you do. You do you perceive that there's a difference? And um, no, but we have people who have worked with us for a very, very long time who have devoted themselves to the Sangha. That's my number one criteria, right? They've devoted themselves to the Sangha. They've learned all the roles. They've learned all the administrative functions. Um, so it's a little bit different in the sense that it's not just a, an anointment. It's like an evolution. So 
my understanding is that the Sangha also supports this development of teachers internally, right? Um, the people who are, have that level of commitment. And it's huge. I mean, just ask these poor burned out people, <laughs> three of whom replaced only two of us, but, um, but also we're not dead. So we still stand in as advisors and backups and uh, for those kinds of really thorny issues where some consultation is needed. So uh, I just want to make sure I'm hearing you correctly because I really appreciate Anne's question because I think it does go to what the issue I've been struggling with from the people that I hear. Not me. Yeah. I'm not struggling with this one. I'm sure everybody's clear about that. And that is, it sounds like what you're talking about, that we are encouraging people who are seeking to know more and learn more and take on more responsibility in an organic way within the Sangha, not from without the yes. Sangha. Okay, that, that to me, that is a huge um, difference and I really appreciate that's hearing that because it goes to what you said, this idea of bringing someone outside who does not know and has not been here from the beginning. I just, it just brings me to tears hearing you talk about it like that because that makes me realize that is why I practice here. Yeah. Because it is, it is a whole, it is not just a Zen Center. Right. It is a home for my practice. Right. And when Thank we, you. When we thought about this, we, we think organically. So for me, it's like tending a garden, you know, and you see, oh, these sunflowers need more water or whatever. You know, like you're just like, you're tending this garden and organically you see, oh, these are going to be tomatoes, you know. Like there are people who you see clearly evolving this deeper, deeper, deeper commitment to what we're about here and to conveying that, right? And what we're doing is watering those sprouts, you know, like <laughs> is saying, okay, you know, this is your commitment and we want to make sure that we provide an opportunity for growth for everybody, right? So it's, I've had people come to me and say, you never invited me to be on a council. Right? And what I say to them is, you never expressed an interest in being on the council. And then they'll say, well, but I feel like I'm left out because I've been invited. And I'm like, it isn't like a garden party. <laughs> it's like you show up, you have taken the precepts, you have done intensives with us. You know, like there's a whole list of criteria. I say, go to the website. You know, if you're willing to make that kind of commitment, let me know, you know. And so very often they come back and they go, yeah, I, no, I can't, I don't want to be that committed. Okay. Anybody can come and sit and appreciate what we're doing, you know, and be as involved as they want to be. That's the way we've structured it. So that's why it's not class-based. It's not rank-based. It's about serving. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. It's about serving. I feel like that should be our motto. Yeah, it is. You know, it is kind of, you know. I think that's common. I, this, this is a, this is a great. I wish we had this on like a YouTube video clip that <laughs> because I, I think it's. Um, I remember going to, to. I remember seeing Flynn and thinking, "Oh wow, maybe I should become a, a psycho Buddhist psychologist because yeah, okay. you, you're just so enamored with yeah. or watching you or." Uh, but I, and also. Yeah, I love our teacher, Lori, Joel, and Todd. You guys are doing a great job. But I think that is com it's common. Everyone, or I'll speak for myself, I see this at work over the years. I'm a little older now, so but I, I can look back how I just got competitive. And it's it's just the initial thought. It's Yeah. And I, I'm not, I can't make the same commitment, but I don't feel any less. No, and you shouldn't. Because I can... Um, come to you. <laughs> well, you know, there's, um, I think what people have to understand is there's uh, an internal commitment and an external commitment. So there are people who are committed to the internal growth of the community. And there are people who are committed to taking what we're doing and learning together out into the world, into their offices, in the places that need them, 
Um, and it's not either or, but I mean, that's to me is like as valuable. If you're transforming a high tech, high pressure environment into something slightly more humane, that's a huge service in the world, right? So, so from my point of view, there isn't prestige or status associated with any of these functions. They all have a very important role to make in the constitution of the Sangha. So if you are raising a sane child, that's a gift to the world, right? That's a huge gift. So if our practice is supporting your capacity to do that, that's as absolutely as good as if you decide you're on the entrustment path because you really, really love teaching, right? Not everybody really, really loves teaching. This was a surprise to me to discover. <laughs> <laughs> I always thought if you asked anybody, they would say, yeah, I want to be a teacher, but unfortunately I'd be a fireman, you know? So there are people who are drawn to teaching, who are, and, and we can watch, all of us as a sangha, how other people are responding to that person as a teacher. That's how organically teachers get grown. They're, they're actually grown by the students who come to them, not by some anointment from on top. You know, that's not the way we do things here. Okay. Oh, oh, so I'm just making you aware that we've got Ellen when you're ready. This is Ellen. Oh, I'm so sorry. I, I'm, I'm just like ranting on. Uh, no, uh, I enjoyed all the ranting. Uh, <laughs> uh, I just wanted to know, uh, where the Zoom Zendo fits into all of this, we're the same, but we're different. And one of was I think I want to know in general and and specifically, there's some people who practice pretty deeply and are deeply involved in the Zoom Zendo. And might there be councils for the Zoom? For yes. The so um, so this is something uh, I think Marie and I have talked about um, the idea that if we have six or seven people who are committed in that way, they're regularly participating. Um, they have taken the precepts. That's an important step. Um, they've uh, practiced with us over time and understand the Apamata way, right? Um, then we would form a council, and that council would advise us about how to improve our online relating, right? Yeah. And also help um, be sort of the information um, gatherers of how, how the online um, cloud Zendo is functioning. Yeah, and I think just quite naturally, uh, we begin online relating with one another. Yeah. Almost like a council, almost like a council. Well, that's right. And so, um, so when you think that there are five or six people, you, you can look at the criteria on the website for formation of councils. Right. And it lists what it is, you know. Um, this is, this, it actually depends on people having some years of practice with us so that they really have depth in their understanding because they're going to be viewed as, you know, some sort of authority by others. And they're going to be teaching people in roles for like AV monitor, right? So, and we definitely want to broaden that base of people who have the capacity to be AV monitors. So, um, so absolutely, we would love to have a, a Clouds Endo Council for sure. Well, okay, for example, I can't be a Navy monitor. I've tried. I've tried it. <laughs> it's it's just not my forte. Yeah. But I but I might be on a on a a Zen in the Zoom Zen. I would be part of a council on yeah. a Zoom Zen, yeah. perhaps. Yeah. And so might there? I'm, I'm just. I guess we would have to actually do it before we would see exactly how it worked. I would think there's exactly right. other other things one could do besides be a monitor. Everything we've done has been emergent from how students are advancing and, and faring, right? right? So we, first we had one council. We didn't want that to seem like the teacher's pets. You know? So we immediately recognized we would create a council whenever we had six or seven people who meet, the, meet those criteria, right? And who care about supporting the Sangha. So, so then we began to see, oh, this is how this network gets established of people caring for the Sangha and caring for each other and also deepening in their practice together with spiritual friends. So that was emergent. And whatever we do, you know, with the cloud Zendo will be emergent based on the needs of the people who are participating and what makes sense, right? 
Yeah. So we would have to see how would that council function? And then they would make requests. They would say, we would like to learn roles, or we would like to study a book together, or we would, you know, like the councils determine where they want to spend their energy and time together. It's really peers. Yeah. Thank Does that you. make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, because yeah, I kind of see the the cloud zendo and the up at the Austin Zendo, I think it's merged together and it's also separate <clears throat> you know it's it's merged together oh i've got something in my throat <clears throat> it's merged together in the sense that all the people that um spend time online from from the austin's end or are very bonded with the yes. people yeah. online and then you also have people that don't um appear online so for me it's like i feel very bonded to so many of the people at Apamade, you know, I mean, Joel and Laurie, and there's so many people that um, <clears throat> Kim and Joan and, you know, that, that appear regularly online. And and I think for me over these last couple of years, I mean, I'm already part of the Just This Sangha, which is a branch of the Apamade. So I've experienced the on-site, in-person connectivity as well. But the connectivity I've experienced online has been incredible you know the intensity of that of that connection and how um it's really surprised me how how connected i feel to apamada yeah and how I, how you are all a fabric of me and i feel a part of the fabric of of apamada and and i would not have envisaged that before the pandemic that all being online yeah. only online in the presence of a sangha how could i possibly feel like this and but the experience of it is as you know i come on every day yeah. um yeah. become very very connected and feel very much almost like you know i can imagine myself sat with you all next to you all i feel the essence and presence of like i know how joe fe joel feels you know i know his essence his physical presence you know laurie and you know you literally feel their their presence because yeah. they're so they're so present. So I think a lot of it to do with Apamada online and on site is how much each person from each side partakes, isn't it? In Yes. In, yes, in absolutely. I mean, it's it's this is what's available. And it's interesting to me because before the pandemic, this kind of thing was relatively rare. Um, businesses were doing it, but ordinary people, you know, no. Um, so the pandemic slammed us into this environment, which was disorienting and at first off-putting in a way, you know, like you just felt like, oh, this is so alien, seeing the faces on the screen, huh? you know, but then we all became quite familiar and at home in this environment. And now I think it's pretty much mundane, you know, people just take it for granted. And I'm, I think that's one of the great gifts of the pandemic in connecting us and allowing us to be connected over a distance in this way. Even people who live in Austin, just the traffic is bad, you know, can, can jump on Zoom and be connected. Yeah, yeah. And we value your participation and we value your input and don't uh, hesitate to tell us, if, you know, when we forget. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, it was funny when Nancy said yesterday, what about us? <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it just reminded me. Oh yes, yes, we have to. We have to. You know, I I had it in mind. I just had forgotten. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm sorry to, to butt in, yeah. but I, I, can I add something here that you you were just saying? You know, like yeah. businesses used to have Zoom yeah, meetings yeah. Or, or other teleconferencing. Yeah, teleconferencing, yeah. and the, and my experience with those was those are things I had to show up for, and it was such a pain. And it was a waste of time, and I, you know, that I, I was, I was completely <laughs> withdrawn into my own yeah. desires around that. Yeah. And the difference here, and, and, and I think for a lot of scientists in mind, with the pandemic, is that people show up so that they can support each other. Yes, that's that's, that's right. That's right. And, and Flint really, you know, he gave a talk several weeks ago. Offering the same sort of encouragement and the same sort of overview that you're for giving, and that, to me, that was a central point that he that he made. Yeah. What can you do for the sangha? Show up. Show up with the idea of supporting each other. Yeah, that's the primary thing you can do. When people ask, "What can we do?" That's the first thing. If you're doing that, that's huge. And you know that if you sit in the zendo or if you're online and a person is there who's not normally there. 
you feel that presence. If a person is absent who's normally there, you feel that absence, you know? Um, and it's very interesting to me how energetic it is. And I'm sure it feels the same way for folks online. You see, oh, Lori's here, you know? Oh, great, Lori's here. You know, it's just like this sense of buoyancy that comes from seeing the people coming, you know, just, just coming. So that's the primary thing, yeah. I want to take advantage of this time to ask about questions I've had. Uh, and I'm looking at when I'm gone and when you're gone. And as I understand it, uh, Akamata is not Soto Zen. It is a branch off Soto Zen. And it is unique. And so, um, and this is probably what's happening right now with the, and I forget what they're called, the, the group of, that's doing the teacher, what do you call entrustment it? Entrustment training. The entrustment training, that there is a way that new teachers will come about. You know, in Soto Zen, it's all lined out. Yeah. And this needs to be created and established. And then a concern I have is that there we are, this branch off from the teachings. And so, we're not branched off from the teachings. We're branched off from the uh, institution. Yes. And how do we get the teachings? Do we get them by reading books or maybe bringing in teachers, as we talked about from Soto Zen? A variety of others, yeah. And, and I think it's important that we've always gotten the teachings from Ewan Flint. And Ewan Flint someday will be gone. And Lori and Joel and Todd. But you and Flint's. Uh, foundation is very deep. We've been studying a long time. Yes. <laughs> and we were. And Lori, <laughs> Lori and Joe are incredible, but there are people that have that that is their life, and that's the Soto Zen. Uh, Maybe. Yeah, and yeah. it's not that yeah. we need that person forever, but that that we would need that plugging in. No. Well, we just talked about it, about having people occasionally. Yeah, having occasional guest speakers is fine. Yeah. Or teachers to come to teach a class or something. Depends on what the programmatic needs are. So. But those are my concerns about the future of Appamod when I will not be here. <laughs> when will not be here. How, how, we, how we continue to have our no, to you establish our light teachers. You don't trust Flint and I? Well, how, I think have we done may, so badly so far? I think you may not be here either. Yeah, do you think we don't plan for that? Well, that's what I'm asking about. Yeah, yeah. and that's exactly what Flint and I talk about all the time. And so it's being established yeah. now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. This, is, this is our ongoing conversation. You know? And it's always based on what needs to happen next for the Sangha. This is how everything has grown. What needs to happen next? Councils came about because they had experienced students who were sitting, who were kind of like, okay, you know, now what? You know, they wanted to do more. They wanted to train more. Do we send them off to some other place? No. We figure out how do we grow their practice and their understanding? How do we deepen that? We started a council. Now it's all organic. So this is the same thing. We aren't at that place yet. But both Flint and I are qualified to give Dharma transmission. That's another thing. We have the lineage from the Soto Zen tradition. We're not lacking, you know. We're another one of myriad offshoots of Soto Zen, by the way, um, that are practicing in a different way. Yeah. So is it possible that you would transmit Dharma? to one of our entrusted teachers at some point certainly. in the future? Yeah, certainly that's possible. It's most likely that it would be transmitted through Flint because then both of our names would be on the lineage documents. So he follows me. So it would be likely through Flint. And uh, um, <clears throat> then the lineage goes includes me and him both. Whereas if I do it, then it's just me and Flint isn't included. And that, that, that is not right. Right. Yeah. I'm a huge gear shift. Yes. Um, I, I have a curiosity <clears throat> about the altar. Mm -hmm. um, and it, it, to me, it, it's a 
Well, I guess I just want to say that very recently I fell in love with the altar <laughs> <laughs> in a way that I didn't expect. Um, and, and I just want to name that that's my curiosity. I, I don't really uh, know what to do about it. Or, yeah. I mean, I obviously want to care for the altar, yeah. um, but it, it comes up in the questions of online um, mm -hmm. trainings or I don't know, there's just something in me that is like so deeply in love with it now and I see the, yeah. where I feel, I feel it um, and it feels important. Yeah, yeah, I think it is important and I think one of the things that surprised me the most about practice, that I never expected, I mean I really thought in the beginning of practice as a kind of intellectual activity, um, something to do with your mind, um, conceptual, you know. And then the thing that struck me that with a, the force of a freight train was the devotional aspect of it. How you come to have through practice, mm -hmm. through inhabiting the forms, through caring for the altar, this sense of devotion. And it can't be installed in someone, you know, like it, it has to be evoked. And not everyone experiences it that way. Um, there's, there's nothing magical about the objects on the altar, but there's something about the power and presence of it when you have that sense of devotion. Yeah. That's very touching, very moving to me to see it, you know. I have a, an altar in my well, home Zen note, you know, um, and it's, uh, it has the white Buddha that Flint gave me on it. And, um, you know, yet everything on it has meaning for me. But nothing is like a special object itself, right? It's how we treat them, how we hold them. And then that devotion expanded, you know, or to expand space, you know. And um, we start to realize how much um, we're held in this practice. And that's what brings, I think, that sense of devotion. And I think, I think for me, Peg, I think it took about 10 years for the forms to actually get into my body. <laughs> actually begin to kind of be transformative and change things and and yeah. help you have a different relationship with the world like 10 years of doing them before it was like ah yeah <laughs> you know, to really kind of feel that that difference of how we relate with everything else how the forms help us to relate with everything else it takes so much time doesn't it for it to to get in okay. yeah Absolutely. And, and that's why it's really hard when newcomers say, well, why do we bow? Do it for 10 years and you tell me, you know? <laughs> <laughs> you can only find out that. Ellen, did you have a question? Uh, I just wanted to uh, speak on altars. Not only it's nice to have an altar because you can actually, if you're not able to come to Apamata, you can actually participate in the forms. Yeah yourself in your own home, but also from the point of view of creativity. This morning I was thinking, I was looking at my altar and uh, it's pretty creative. <laughs> I'd, like to, I'd like to show it to you. Actually, I've got all these Dia, Dia de, de los Muertos uh, figures uh, on it uh, because I, to remember the uh, inevitability of death and so forth. And, and something else I've done that I, I I like and I see as creative is one time in a class, Peg, you sent those of us in this class at someone's request, a picture of your home altar. And so instead of having your picture on my altar, like you have uh -huh. jo uh, Joko's on yours, I have a picture of your altar. More my relate, that's who my, that's my relationship with you. <laughs> it's, it's to the altar. <laughs> it's, it's something it's the picture wasn't right but you're having our two altars together seem more right and there's <laughs> something uh creative and oh attuned is uh, uh absolutely the most recent word uh yeah. that I, that i really like in the creation of personal altars definitely um you know cassie did a project a few years ago that was taking photos of people's home altars their personal altars and, uh, and, and it was just a wonderful project. So she came, she came to Abamad and, and I said, well, we have a couple of altars, you know, so, <laughs> so we have this altar and we've got, you know, the altar in the study, it's the founder's altar. And I said, no, oh, you know, there's the altar in the practice discussion room. And then I realized that I had that altar. I had the teacher's altar right next to it. 
And I had the care altar, which was the, you know, pictures of the hands like this and Ben and as a baby, you know. And then, you know, and then and then we have the kitchen altar. And I said, yeah, we we, we do have quite a few altars. <laughs> <laughs> And then of course we've got the Buddha outside, you know, that's another altar. So yeah, yeah. It's but it is a, a, a wonderful opportunity to be creative and to think about what you honor, what you cherish, and what you want reflected. Um, that um, that every day you'll be, you know, pouring this devotion toward. Yeah. For me, this one is different in my heart than my own part. I mean, John Eric and I have so many altars. We have travel altars. We set up altars everywhere we go. But this one it represents the Sangha somehow yeah. in my heart. It's the heart of the Sangha. Yeah. It's the heart of the Sangha for sure. This great big rock on it. <coughs> what is that? Rock? I'm, I'm part oh. of that is surely the, the renewed devotion of the flowers group. Yes. Oh, oh my God. God. The flowers are spectacular. The rock. Um, well, Flint and I were in Switzerland. He was doing a retreat, and uh, okay, the we were staying at this little European hotel, and Urs was the manager of the hotel. Urs, um, and Urs said, "Would you like to go on a hike up the mountain?" And you know, Urs was probably my age, and by age I am now. And so we said, "Oh, sure, fine." He starts bounding up the mountain like a mountain goat. And Flint and I, were, <laughs> you know, following him, you know, and. Um, we're looking around and oh, there's all this beautiful stone, you know, and I said to Flint, oh, it would be so cool to bring back a stone for our altar, like Joko had a stone on her altar instead of a Buddha. I said, it'd be so cool. And so, Bruce hears us and he goes, oh, would you like this one? How about this one? You know, he starts <laughs> flinging these stones <laughs> up there in our array for us to, to look at. And so we picked it up, five stones. He's bounding down the hill, you know, with these <laughs> huge stones. That stone is heavy. And it took a year for them to ship it to us because it came by boat. Yeah. <laughs> but it's white marble. And it just, it was the one we, we arrayed them all in the yard of the hotel. And we spent a lot of time looking at that, you know. Well, this one seems friendly. You know, <laughs> and we feel so much time looking at it. And then after a while, this one, just the presence of it, just, and it looks like a mountain, right? Mm -hmm. It's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's just, I think for Joko, it just represented life as it is. You know, like mm -hmm. there's just no quarrel with it. It's just life as it is. And it's not, for her, it was very important not uh, to have a Buddha uh, because that uh, always gave people the impression that we worship Buddha, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. instead of, Buddha being a teacher. And also that came hundreds of years later from Buddha, the idea of a Buddha statue. Yes, the idea of a statue. It was always, there was always an absence. Um, oh, was, didn't we have a stone before this? It was just small. Yeah, yeah a small stone, yeah. yeah. A really small stone. Yeah, for a long time. Yeah. Um, which was another adventure of me in the stone yard. And, um, and it's, you know, custom stone or whatever. It's like vast, vast stone, flagstone, <laughs> gravel, you know. And I'm wandering around in this yard for at least three and a half hours. Oh. <laughs> and finally, I found this beautiful river stone that could be on that altar. So I went into the office with it, the little trailer office there, and I said, so how much is this stone? <laughs> and they looked at each other and they said, well, ma'am, usually we weigh the truck first. <laughs> 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 and I said, oh, oh, do you want me to bring drive over the <laughs> And they said, no, no. And I said, well, you know, can I buy it? And they said, sure. <laughs> and I said, well, how much is it? And they said, 89 cents. <laughs> <laughs> and I know after I left, they said she was here three. <laughs> Stop. <laughs> is that the one that's in the side zone, though? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's the, that very one. It's an Arizona River <coughs> stone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, anyway, that's the background of the stones. Yeah. So, we have 15 minutes for tea.